Gardening is all about raising plants, and this section will cover just a little bit of plant science so that you understand what plants need to grow. As I was developing this course, I asked a group of experienced gardeners to suggest topics that I should be sure to include. I got a great list of topics to cover that has really informed this course. One gardener said that the number one rookie mistake she saw among new gardeners was that people planted plants where the person wanted the plant to be, but not where the plant wanted to be. I agree, as gardeners we need to learn to understand the needs of different plants. All plants need certain things to be able to grow, but different plants need a different amount of these things. As gardeners, we have to be able to think like a plant and recognize what it needs so that we can match the plant to the place where it will be happy and most productive. In simplest terms, we can say that plants need just a few things to live. The sun, both to warm the earth to a suitably warm temperature and to drive photosynthesis, water and air, both of which help regulate plant processes, and nutrients to grow healthy and strong. Let's dive into each of these in a bit more detail. Plants need the sun for two reasons. The first is for warmth. What makes Earth different from all other planets that have been discovered so far? We happen to be in this magical Goldilocks zone of being close enough to the sun to have warm-ish temperatures and liquid water, at least at some times of the year. And we're not so close to the sun that the climate is scorching hot. This means that we have plants and that they grow well, at least at some times of the year when you talk about a cold climate. The challenge of living in a place with a cold climate is that the temperatures are too cold to sustain plant growth throughout the year. Air and water temperatures need to be above freezing for photosynthesis to occur, not to mention that many plants lose their leaf for the winter. Once it's warm enough, plants also need the sun to drive photosynthesis, the magical process by which beams of sunshine produce energy to grow vegetative tissue. Plants have different light needs, which are broadly described as full sun, partial sun or partial shade, and shade. The timing of sunshine can also be important. Afternoon sun is often more intense because temperatures are typically warmer in the afternoon and there's greater evaporative demand that can drive water loss from plants. Lastly, it's not just about whether or not the clouds are out. Plants compete with each other for sunlight and for resources. Plants that are too crowded will have limited access to the magical sunlight and won't have as much potential to grow. Just like us, plants need water and air to carry out fundamental processes. Water is needed to produce energy during photosynthesis and to move nutrients throughout the plant. Different types of plants have different water requirements. Cacti are good examples of plants that have been adapted to extremely dry conditions and don't need much water. Other plants, however, can be incredibly thirsty. As you plan your garden, you'll want to select plants that match the amount of water that's naturally available. Or, if a plant requires more water, you'll have to provide a way to provide extra water by hand watering or irrigation. While we often think about water, plants also need air. For many plants, growing conditions are ideal when the soil holds about the same amount of air and water. Plant roots need oxygen in the soil, which is why you can drown a plant by overwatering it. Just like people, plants need nutrients in order to grow healthy and strong. And don't forget, these nutrients are passed on to us when we eat plants for food. In particular, three macronutrients of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are needed in the largest amounts. Many other nutrients are needed in smaller amounts. All these nutrients can be derived from the soil or will need to be added manually using fertilizers and other amendments. The soil section of this course provides more details on how to ensure your plants have the nutrients they need. We've covered a lot of material so far. You've assessed your garden location, broken ground, and improved the soil. It's finally time to plant. But how do you know when you're supposed to plant everything for the best chance of success? The planting times vary for different species and varieties because of differences in the preferred growing temperature. For example, many greens like lettuce and spinach grow well in relatively cool temperatures. Seeds of these plants can be planted early in the season about the time of last frost and they'll grow well in the spring. But they won't grow well in the summer when the temperatures rise. On the other hand, plants like tomatoes and melons love warm temperatures and they need those warm temperatures for seeds to germinate and plants to grow. These plants are typically started indoors in cold climates and then transplanted outside once the weather is warm enough. The dates when different plants are ready to go into the ground will depend upon the growing season where you live. If you haven't already looked up the average dates of your first spring and last fall frost, you'll want to do this before moving ahead. Because the growing season length varies so widely, it's common to use the average date of last frost in the spring 
as an anchor for discussing planting dates. You'll also want to consider the total number of days in your growing season, as that will dictate the annual plants that you can grow. If your growing season is only 100 days long, you won't be able to grow a melon that takes 120 days to mature without significant efforts to extend your growing season. Fortunately, the number of short season varieties continues to grow, and you may have options to find varieties designed specifically for short and cool climates. Once you find your average date of last frost in the spring, you'll want to start thinking about time before and after that date. Don't ever forget that the average date of last frost is just an average. In any given year, the actual date of last frost can vary by several weeks. An early spring could be an opportunity to get your garden in a bit sooner, but it could also put you at risk of frost damage if you put plants or seeds in the garden too early and then that final frost comes late in the season. Don't try to push the envelope to plant early if you're a beginning gardener. It's better to plant a little on the late side and have success than to see your plants damaged by late spring frosts. First, let's talk about perennial plants because they're relatively straightforward and the majority of plants follow the same pattern. This would include perennial flowers and other plants that you purchase from the store, as well as perennial plants that you're dividing. In general, you want to plant perennials in the spring when the danger of frost is lessening. Soils should not be wet, which they can be early in the spring. Rather, you want the soils to have warmed and dried slightly so that the plants will have adequate air and water in the soil to encourage new growth. As the season progresses and the temperatures rise, conditions for planting or transplanting perennials start to deteriorate. While it is possible to plant perennials in the middle of summer, many more precautions would need to be taken to ensure that plants don't dry out during hot and sunny summer days. The vast majority of perennials can be planted in the spring. You can look at entire catalogs of plants or take a stroll through your local greenhouse to get a sense for the wide diversity of plants that are available in spring. The bulbs of many plants that flower in the summer are planted in the spring, including plants like gladiolas, lilies, dahlias, and crocosmia. Perennial fruit plants are also best to plant in spring. Most perennials can be divided in spring. As you purchase plants, look for additional instructions or guidance about particular times during the spring when that particular plant should be planted. In general, the more cold sensitive a plant tends to be, for example, if it's generally found in warmer hardiness zones and climates, the longer you'll want to wait until after your last frost date to plant that particular plant. But there's only so much that you can do during the busy spring season. Fortunately, many perennial plants can be planted in the late summer or fall after the hottest summer weather has passed. The idea here is the same as spring, but flip to account for impending fall frosts. You want to avoid the heat of midsummer as much as possible since plants will be more susceptible to moisture stress and less able to cope with the shock of being moved. Once the days start to cool down in late summer, you can begin to plant perennial plants again. One challenge to planting in late summer or early fall is that the plant selection is not as great as it is in the spring. However, it can be a really great time to get plants at bargain prices. Just be sure not to go too crazy and make sure that the plants are a good fit for your garden location and your gardening style. Fall is also the time to plant many bulbs for early spring flowers, like tulips, daffodils, and crocuses. Many trees and shrubs can also be planted in the fall. Many perennials can also be divided in the late summer or fall when they're done flowering. Now, let's think about annual plants which use the same principles but require a bit more thinking in regard to timing. When you purchase annual seeds, the packet will likely contain instructions on how to plant the seeds, including the timing. Here's an example of planting instructions for a package of lettuce that is pretty typical of plants that can be planted early in the spring. The instructions say to plant the seeds outdoors directly into garden soil starting four to six weeks before the average date of the last spring frost. The soil will need to be about 40 degrees Fahrenheit for the seeds to germinate, so if the year is trending towards being colder than average, it may not be worth it to plant especially early. The instructions also suggest succession planting, where seeds are planted every few weeks to ensure a good harvest. That means that rather than planting your entire seed packet all at once, you can spread your plantings throughout the season. This is good for a few reasons. First, if early season conditions don't turn out to be favorable, you haven't lost all your seed. Even if your first planting fails, one of your later ones will be successful and you'll capture as much of the growing season as possible. Second, you'll avoid the situation where you have an entire bed of lettuce mature all at once, where you might not be able to eat it all or even give it away. Here's what this looks like. The first planting will start six weeks before the average last frost date and then continue with planting every two weeks for as long as desired. Because the plants take about 66 days to mature, 
harvesting can start as soon as seven weeks after the first planting if conditions are favorable. Here's another example. This one is for sunflower. It says to begin planting after the last frost and plant every two weeks for continuous flowering. Plants may become mature and flower in as little as 90 days or about 13 weeks after the first planting. Some plants require warmer air and soil temperatures for planting, and the instructions will usually say something along the lines of planting after all danger of frost is passed. In a cold climate, it can seem like a frost could come at any time, and so it can be hard to know exactly when this might be. In these instances, using succession planting to start plants every few weeks can be a helpful way to get started and reduce risk from a damaging spring frost. In this instance, we would wait until after the last average date of frost, until conditions have been frost-free for several weeks and the soil has had time to warm. We would also look to the weather forecast to make sure that there are no frosts or cold spells in the forecast. At that point, it would be reasonably safe to plant seeds of heat-loving plants outside. For these plants, there's also the opportunity to start plants indoors and then transplant these outside when the danger of frost has passed. The benefit of this is that it allows for earlier blooms or harvests. For example, planting Coreopsis directly outside will result in flowers about 14 weeks after the average last frost date. However, if seeds are started indoors 8 weeks earlier and then transplanted outside, flowering could start as early as 6 weeks after the last frost date. That's a big jump on the season. You can either start seeds yourself or purchase plants from a local nursery. The transplant date will depend upon the plant. For example, seedlings of cool season vegetables like cabbage can be set out near the last frost date, while heat loving plants like tomatoes will need to go out later after the frost danger is mostly passed and the soil has warmed. You can use the same ideas about when to plant to determine when to do fall plantings, which you may do for cool season vegetables. It's the same method, except that you're counting backward from the average date of the first frost in the fall. Let's go back to the lettuce example. The lettuce has 66 days to maturity, or just under seven weeks. However, the short fall days and lower temperatures in the late season mean that it'll take lettuce a little longer to mature. Let's estimate that it'll take eight to 10 weeks for lettuce to mature in the fall. Lettuce is also able to accommodate some cooler temperatures and a slight frost, so you may be able to harvest it well after the average date of the first fall frost, particularly in a warmer year. Some people really love this aspect of gardening and really nerd out on determining the perfect dates and maximizing the season, but it's not for everyone. If all these dates are making you nervous, take a deep breath and know that it can be really simple too. Just pick a few dates for planting to start with. If you want to grow cold hardy vegetables, you may want to plant these crops on one or two dates slightly before or near the average last frost date to get these crops growing. Succession planting can be helpful, but just do the additional plantings when it's convenient for you and don't worry if you can't stick with a two-week schedule. After the danger of frost is mostly passed, this is your prime time for planting most flowers and vegetables. You can batch most of your planting into one or two days if you want to, or putter at it throughout the spring. Pick the days that are convenient for you and when the weather cooperates. Often the most enjoyable gardening days are the best ones for the plants too. Pick days that are warm, without too much direct sun or wind, and everyone will have fun in the garden. Starting plants from seed outdoors is pretty straightforward, so let's talk about that. The first thing to do is make sure that your planting site is prepared. Any needed compost or soil amendments should be added in advance. The soil should be adequately warm for what you're planting, and the soil should be moist but not wet. Weed and rake the planting space to be smooth. Next, develop a plan for your garden space. It's helpful if you've already made a general plan for your garden layout ahead of time. Once you're in the garden, you can decide exactly how you want to lay things out. The easiest way to do this is actually sketch out your planting using a stick or pencil to draw out the rows or planting areas for spacing. Drag a pencil or use your finger to make a trench of the appropriate depth or poke individual holes for seeds. Plant seeds at the depth and spacing specified on the seed packet. Cover these with loose soil and tamp down gently to ensure contact between the soil and seed. Then finally, water the seeds well. My style of gardening is to try and plant my seeds directly into the soil outside as much as possible, but there are some really great reasons for why you may want to start plants from seed inside of containers. Containers are especially good for starting cold sensitive plants indoors to get a jump start on the growing season. Beginning plants outdoors where it is warm will allow plants to grow faster so that they'll yield flowers or fruit earlier, something that's very important in a short garden season. 
Containers are also good for starting plants that may have a tough time germinating out of doors in coarse garden soils. Compared to garden soils, seed starting mixtures are cozy and give shy seeds a little extra help in coming out of their shells. And of course, containers can also be used throughout the growing season. Let's go over what you need to get started. First, you'll need containers to grow the seeds in. These can be containers specifically designed for gardening and starting seeds. Note that if you reuse any old plant pots or planting trays, you should give them a thorough washing to avoid any potential disease issues. You can also use any other containers, old yogurt containers, milk cartons, or other containers. Just be sure to poke a few holes in the bottom to allow water to drain. You will also need a planting mix specifically designed for seed starting or for containers. Don't use garden soils as these are too heavy and coarse for use in containers. Most seed starting mixtures don't actually include any real soil, that's why they're so fluffy and light. Also, be sure to start with fresh planting mix. Don't reuse old container mixes, which are likely low in essential nutrients and could harbor a nasty pest or disease. You can mix up your own planting mix. There are a variety of recipes out there, but they often follow similar principles and are made out of materials that you can purchase at a garden store or online. This recipe uses compost, perlite, vermiculite, and coir. The compost could be a bagged product that you purchase, or it could be from your garden if you had a well-decomposed compost that had been screened to ensure that it has a fine texture. Perlite and vermiculite are two minerals that you can purchase at garden supply stores. These are the materials that look like styrofoam beads in potting mix, but that's not styrofoam in your mix at all. These minerals help keep the soil light and airy so that it's easy for fragile little seedlings to grow. Coir is a fiber made from coconut husks and provides organic material for potting mixes. Coir is increasingly available as a substitute for peat because peat is often unsustainably mined from wetlands. Either of these materials can be used depending on what's available. Here's another recipe that's a bit simpler but would be lower in nutrients because compost is not included. When you're ready to plant, put your mix in a large bucket or container, either the store-bought mix or the ingredients for your homemade mix. Mix them thoroughly. Then add enough water to moisten the mix thoroughly, but not so much water that it's sopping wet. You want the mixture to be crumbly and moist. Fill your containers, pushing down on the mix gently to ensure that the containers are full and help settle the soil. Next, you'll plant the seeds. Use the instructions on the seed package, which will tell you the depth and spacing for each type of seed. If you are tempted to plant more seeds than are recommended, you know, just in case, don't. If you plant too many seeds, your plants will grow to be crowded and will not be as big and healthy. Be sure to label everything now. Although you think you'll remember what you planted, you probably won't. If you're planting more than one type of plant, label every tray or container. Keep containers in a warm place. You can use a heated seedling mat to warm soils and help seedlings germinate. Plants can germinate in dark conditions, but will need to be placed in light to grow. Use artificial lighting designed for plants if you want them to grow faster. If you're relying on natural light, you may want to rotate your trays every few days to keep plants from going too tall and spindly in one direction. A plastic cover can help retain moisture during germination. Check plants every day to ensure that there's adequate moisture. Use a mist bottle to help keep very small seedlings moist. And if possible, let plants soak up water from underneath using the holes in the pots. So set the tray into a pan of water rather than watering over top. Seedlings grown indoors will be fragile compared to those grown outside. If you move them outside too abruptly, they can be damaged by strong sun, wind, or rain. They need to get acclimated to outside conditions. You can help your plants adjust by taking them outside for increasing amounts of time over 6 to 10 days. Start by putting plants out on a mild day and keeping them out of direct sun. Each day, increase the amount of time the seedlings are outside and the amount of sun exposure that they receive. Keep them out of wind and rain at first, but by the end of the period, the plants should be able to stay out all day and night, just like any other outdoor plant. 